right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back today with a very good episode with somebody who I'm really excited to talk to because we're going to get a little grim and a little cynical, but we're going to talk about uh, the mess we've got ourselves in as human beings. Uh, we've got Guy McPherson, PhD. How you doing, sir? Good. Thank you. <laughs> Another day upright. I can't complain. Yeah. And if you did, nobody would care, I guess. That's right. <laughs> Um, he is expert in natural resources, ecology, and evolutionary biology. So I would say he knows his stuff pretty well. Um, so things aren't as good as we might think they are. Is that true? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> A lot of things have gone wrong. It's interesting because I hear almost every day from somebody, I get an email message. Somebody writes to me and they say, you know, you're obviously wrong. Things are going fine. And, and so I ask him, are you by chance a, a Caucasian heterosexual male <laughs> living in the first world? Yeah. And I say, well, yeah. How'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that hard to figure out, really? That, they tell us that we're doing fine, and that's, I believe it. Right. Yeah. I actually saw somebody recently, they said, we're richer than we've ever been. I say, okay, all right. Just hang on to your that's hats. Cool. Speak for yourself. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll start it off. You know, you've spoken a lot about human beings and our unsustainable habits that are eventually going to kill us all. What are some of these driving factors that are bringing on the, our, our untimely demise? Well, first, Chris, thank you very much for allowing me to participate in this conversation. I'm no fan of human extinction much less in the short term. But I but I believe people deserve to know what's happening in the world. And that's what drives my freely available work. In response to your question, personal consumption is a major driving force. Very few people can distinguish between needs and wants. And apparently the motto of industrial civilization is, must go faster. The demands of nearly 8 billion people projected to hit the 8 billion mark on the 15th of this month, so a week from today, the demands of nearly 8 billion people on this planet cannot be met on a finite planet. Yet every generation expects more than the prior generation. And in fact, parents expect their children to have an easier life than they had filled with improved technology. That technology comes at a huge cost. Everywhere I turn, people are expecting more, more, and more. And more is expensive, as it turns out. You, you know, I hear all the time about we're just going to switch from this to that. We're going to switch from oil to wind turbines or whatever. And you, you think rare earths, we're in a better shape mining rare earths than we are mining oil? Come on. Anyway. Yeah. Enough about that. That's the general idea is we just more, yeah. more and more. That's all, we, that's all we need is more of everything. And the consumption habits are the things that the people in the green energy, they want to say that, oh, we'll just switch and everything will be great. Yes, as if, right? I mean, the, the materials alone, first of all, to make a wind turbine or a solar panel requires an enormous amount of fossil fuels. There's a bunch of embedded oil and coal in any solar panel. And then what's the environmental cost of the solar panel compared to the coal and the oil? It's enormous. But most people don't want to think about that sort of thing because, uh, like me, everybody I know wants to have an answer especially an answer that somebody else comes up with and that doesn't cost me a thing. <laughs> right. More of that more, more, more behavior. Yeah. This misconception that technology will save us all, I find to be, is the, the opium of the masses. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you saw the 2021 film, Don't Look Up. Oh, yeah, yeah. But the final scene, somebody says, we really did have, ev have everything, didn't we? That's it. We really did. And notice the use of past tense, right. you know, because they knew they were about to die. <laughs> and we really did have everything, too. 
And I'm using past tense because I think we don't have long. Yeah. And you, you famously made some predictions over the years. And I got to say, I bet you're right on with that. And especially in 2020, you said that there was going to be a mass die off. Uh, well, sure enough, we had a huge pandemic that is still killing all these people. Right. And I was writing about that pandemic in, in my first significant blog post, which was based on a presentation I gave to the graduating class of hmm, something at the University of Arizona. And, and I wrote about a pandemic there. That was 2017. Wow. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It was 2007. Oh, wow. Even even better. It was the summer of 2007. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, was, I don't mean to say I told you so, but... <laughs> yeah. Right. And, you know, I have been wrong with, with my predictions. Um, the annual review series is the most conservative of peer-reviewed journals that come out with an issue once a year. And the annual review of Earth and Planetary Sciences in 2012, the 2012 issue, which came out sometime in January of 2012, the annual review for the Earth and Planetary Sciences projected an ice-free Arctic in 2016, plus or minus three years. Well, an ice-free Arctic is hugely important because when you when you switch to something even darker than this, right, a, a very dark blue from white, when you go from white ice to a deep blue of the ocean, it greatly changes the environment. It incredibly accelerates the heating, essentially immediately. And so I predicted human extinction in 2017 or 2018. I can't remember which, even though I get an email message once a week pointing out <laughs> that I'm an idiot and I was wrong. <laughs> I still don't remember which it was. So I'm very glad that the paper turned out to be incorrect. And because as a conservation biologist, I'm a huge fan of life on Earth, including human life, despite the people I run into now and then. <laughs> but all that aside, I'd much rather have us here than not. Yeah. And, you know, that, that projection turned out to be wrong. And that's fine. That's fine with me. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I would love even more to be wrong about the predictions I've made for in the near future as well. Yeah. Yeah, me, me too. But honestly, at the rate I, I'm going with the, what I feel about humanity, if we can go quietly... Okay, but the, the the one sad part is that we're taking wildlife down with us and everything right. else. Right. right, absolutely, we certainly are. We are voracious mm -hmm. in in the way we act with respect to everything, really. Well, there were some cultures that didn't necessarily uh, go down this road and were able to stop themselves, but it was specifically the like the white Western civilization and the industrialized world that, that um, is responsible. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Indigenous peoples throughout the world did not take this approach. The Iroquois Confederacy, famous in North America, used a seven generations approach. And now, of course, there's a corporation named Seven Generations, <laughs> which is doing nothing <laughs> like what they were doing. The idea was they wouldn't, consider any significant decision they wouldn't make the decision until they'd thought about what happened seven generations into the future that's wow. amazing most people these days barely think about their children grandchildren screw them great grandchildren <laughs> whatever right i mean <laughs> out of sight out of mind <laughs> right and so thinking seven generations into the future is remarkable that's at least 140 years and, you know, the, the, the Iroquois Confederacy was for, sort of famous for that, but obviously it didn't catch on. Yeah. Well, and a certain amount of peace just was not, is never a, a viable opponent against hate and violence because violence always prevails. Um, right. Goodness is always susceptible to, you know, some kind of corruption. Um, it's kind of a shame. And I was, but yeah. the, the Native Americans also said something like, um, Nature gives us everything we need to survive for free. It does it. All it asks in return is that we protect it. Right. Yeah. And they did a hell of a lot better at that than we're doing. 
<laughs> I was talking to other people about the, the times when we worshipped the sun or worshipped trees and stuff like that. And I thought mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was the, one of those, we took a left turn at Albuquerque moments where we could have, we could have actually done something fantastic and had, had to, something to be proud of. But so you talked before a lot about um, the history of, of climate change and the greenhouse effect. How long have we known about this? Since at least the 1820s. In the 1820s, French mathematician and physicist Joseph Fourier, for which the Fourier um, series is named, the mathematical series, he proposed that energy reaching the planet as sunlight must be balanced by energy returning to space since heated surfaces emit radiation. So he said it must be the same for Earth as it is for things that I see in my laboratory. Some of that energy, he concluded, must be held within the atmosphere and not returned to space, which is why we, the Earth is warm. Otherwise, we would be like other planets, and they would be either overheated or very cold without being maintained at this relatively comfortable temperature. So he proposed that the atmosphere, that thin covering of air around, surrounding the planet acts the way a glass greenhouse would. He, so as nearly as I can tell, he's the first person who brought up the idea of the greenhouse effect. Energy enters the, the glass walls of the atmosphere, but then it's trapped inside, much like a warming greenhouse. Okay, so that was in the 1820s. The idea was further explored in the 1850s by a female scientist, and that's remarkable because most people, when they look at the sciences, they find a bunch of men, mostly white men. And and, and even if there have been major contributions by, by women, we generally ignore those. So the idea of the greenhouse effect was explored by Eunice Newton Foote in the 1850s. That's Foote with an E on the end. They had great names back then, didn't they? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Her experiments used glass cylinders. And they, she uses glass cylinders to demonstrate that the heating effect of the sun was greater in humid air than in moist air. I mean, in dry air, greater in humid air than in dry air. And, and we can see that, right, if we live near the ocean as opposed to living in the interior of large continent. Tucson, Arizona, where I lived for 20 years, a really dry, hot, dry place. Now I live in Vermont. In New England, closer to the ocean, it's far more humid every single day here than it ever was in Tucson, Arizona. Anyway, Foote detected that the highest degree of heating occurred in a cylinder containing carbon dioxide. Oh, so she discovered the notion of carbon dioxide as a, as a greenhouse gas. Her work foreshadowed the work of an Irish scientist named John Tyndall, who gets a lot of the credit for being first, but he wasn't really first. He, he came along decades, obviously, after Fourier and a short time after Foote. He focused on what kinds of gases played the biggest role in absorbing and holding the heat. So that was Tyndall's contribution. Nobel Prize winning Swedish chemist Svante Arrhenius wrote the first peer reviewed article on the topic of climate change. So here we are many decades later. It was the 1820s Fourier year was, was first encroaching on the idea of greenhouse gases. And Svante Arrhenius wrote the first peer reviewed article on the topic of climate change. It was published in 1896 in the Philosophical Magazine. It was titled, On the Influence of Carbonic Acid in the Air Upon the Temperature of the Ground. It was carbonic acid. That was the term at the time for carbon dioxide. The article predicted a one degree C global average rise in temperature in the year 2000 as a result of human emissions of carbon dioxide. That's pretty remarkable because he was wrong by less than one fourth of a degree. That's, That's amazing. And this is, in no, the, this is in the time when they would sell you radium water. And it was, it was like it's supposed right. to cure you. So that's pretty impressive. Right. That's amazing. And no work had been published on the aerosol masking effect at that time, at least none that I can find. It wasn't until 1929 that that came into play in the peer-reviewed literature. So 33 years after his paper is published. And 
the aerosol masking effect undoubtedly masked more than that less than a quarter of a degree that he was he was off by so that's that's not bad for a paper published 126 years ago and it's pretty good actually yeah that's interesting too and the aerosol effect this is a wild idea and ha- and this kind of saved our butt a little bit over time as far as warming you yeah? Oh, yes, absolutely. Almost nobody knows anything about the aerosol masking effect. I, I'd say it's the best kept secret in climate science. All those wealthy people and all, all those paid climate scientists, all the media personalities, they're all telling you, you must reduce consumption of greenhouse gases. Meanwhile, I've never heard of a billionaire reducing their impact, right? Reducing the number of flights they take mm-hmm. because they're the important people. The aerosol masking effect is relatively little understood. And here's the short version of the story. At the same time, industrial activity produces 43 greenhouse gases that trap heat once the planet is warmed. So the planet has to be warmed first. And then this, these greenhouse gases in the atmosphere trap that heat. Okay. That same industrial activity that produces those greenhouse gases also produces aerosols that block incoming sunlight, much like a series of mirrors in, in space or at the outer edge of the atmosphere. These aerosols that act like mirrors or like umbrellas that prevent incoming sunlight from striking Earth and therefore from warming Earth. So they prevent it from ever getting in. The idea was published in 1929 in a peer-reviewed paper by Anders Angstrom. And that's the first paper I found on the topic. It was 1929. So that was quite a while ago. And 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 yet, you never hear about it. I've never heard a paid climate scientist talk about the aerosol masking effect. Not one time. Yeah. Well, they want to push their agenda without any kind of... It has to be clear and concise so they can't have any like, ah, but there's this thing and... Right, right. Yeah, you know, I'm of the opinion that people can actually balance two thoughts at the same time in their head. <laughs> you really, I, you, I find most Americans can't chew gum and walk at the same time. <laughs> no. Well, no, but that's a that's a physical matter. Oh, okay, not a okay, matter. okay. Now I'm just kidding, Americans. It's all good. We love you. Um, so. We already talked about green energy, thinking that we're going to um, maybe we could elaborate on consumption habits. I mean. Well. How did we get? Here's, yeah, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Between 2012 and 2015, Professor Tim Garrett at the University of Utah had five peer reviewed papers published in the literature, peer reviewed papers. and they point out that civilization is a heat engine. And so that's between 2012 and 2015. In 2020, he published the sixth peer-reviewed paper. He was a senior author on this one and had a couple of co-authors as well. And these papers describe the idea of civilization as a heat engine, no matter how it's powered. And they put numbers on the idea. So it doesn't really matter if we're using solar panels, wind turbines, wave power from the ocean, harnessing all that kind of issue energy still contributes to an overheated earth the bottom line there's no way out mm-hmm. we either maintain civilization and therefore prevent the aerosol masking effect from coming into play and killing us all very rapidly or or we shut down civilization and that makes things happen far worse even faster so maintaining civilization causes a profound increase in greenhouse gases in the last 25 years, we produce more greenhouse gases and therefore more heating than the previous time going back to 1750 in the Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. 25 years. So we've really ratcheted things up. You know, we, we talked earlier about every generation wants things to be better than the previous generation. And, and this is one of the costs is the enormous energy that we create here on Earth and, and that we trap here on Earth as a consequence of needing, needing mm-hmm. more, more, and more. So even if we we take away a lot of the infrastructure we're building and we start, you know, taking away our consumption habits and stuff, we still have 7 billion people that are 
eating industrialized agriculture dependent on it, and also just 7 billion flatulent people. That's enough to keep us that direction? Uh, no, absolutely. You know, it's, it's 8 billion next week. And, and I thought I was going to save the world, right? I knew about this stuff, and so I decided I'm going to move off-grid. So I moved to southern rural New Mexico and created this million-dollar homestead. It's all off-grid. I was raising goats for milk. I became a master cheesemaker, raising chickens, ducks, had a goose named Myrtle. Aww. And it was amazing. It was beautiful. I thought I was going to lead the way. And fortunately, nobody followed or we'd have been really screwed because if everybody, if we suddenly stop or even reduce industrial activity, aerosol masking comes into play and we're all dead even faster. So fortunately, everybody just assumed I was insane. And so they didn't follow my lead. That's a good thing. Yeah. So it's just not even feasible that we are, we've been able to back out at this point. I don't think so. Now, relatively recently, inspired by my work, um, Dr. Ye Tao at Harvard, at Harvard's Roland Institute, came up with the idea of mirrors. So I think this was in 2018, 2017 or 2018. He dropped by to see me. I think it was in 2019. We spent a couple of hours chatting about this, this idea and he went on to develop it. And, and it, it looked very promising, at least initially, but that's been four or five years ago and there's been no traction and a lot of people know about it now. It would take mirrors on the surface of the planet reflecting incoming sunlight before it had a chance to strike earth and therefore warm it up. And originally the number of mirrors required to stabilize the heat at the current level, allow it to not keep going up, but just stop it would be an area the size of the Netherlands. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that's not so horrible. And there's enough sand. Sand is one of the most abundant materials on earth. And then a couple or three years later, and nobody's paying any attention. The word is out. There's no billionaire. There's no government agency stepping forward and saying, yeah, we can do this. And then the, the latest number is required a number of mirrors equivalent to the continental United States, which is a hell of a lot of area yeah. to be covered with mirrors. So I still encourage people to go to mirror.org, M-E-E-R. Dot org because it stands for mirrors energy balance it's it's some acronym mm. mirror is m e e r dot org check it out if you think it's worth supporting please go for it and they need all kinds of volunteer help because like i said no billionaire no government agency is throwing money at this thing and and helping it catch on at this point, I think it's too little too late, yeah. but I might be wrong. So I continue pointing to it as the only best case scenario I see in the near future. Yeah. And, and it's not to the point right now where you're, you know, nude running through the streets with a bottle of whiskey and a gun. And, you know, there's right. still some semblance of... You do that? So, well, you do that too? When, <laughs> when, when the final days are coming, that's going to be my, <laughs> that's going to be how I'm going out, my friend. No, I, every day I have my little gin and tonic and I just see, take it day by day. That's what my motto is. I was given a presentation years ago and I always have a glass of water, right? Because you dry partway through the Q&A and the, something went wrong with the projector. And so the screen was just doing this weird thing. Like they was doing this shimmy thing. I thought, well, that's kind of weird. So I went over to my to my glass of water and I said, "Is it is it is it my vodka or is it something wrong technologically here?" <laughs> this is how one loses credibility at the right. beginning. Of <laughs> <laughs> Why can't you be a drunken scientist and still be credible? Right. Yeah. Well, I hope that the mirror thing would work. It sounds fairly feasible, especially if people people could start even switching over to reflective roofs, and that would do a hell yes. of a lot. Absolutely. And in fact, there's a there's a group within the mirror program that is focused on mirrors on rooftops. 
Mm, awesome. Because in urban areas, think about how much rooftop there is in urban areas. It's enormous. Mm. And you also mentioned stuff about uh, the cities being kind of a heat sink. Uh, what's that effect? What's what's going on there? Right. So it's called the urban heat island effect. The um, concrete and asphalt absorb an enormous amount of heat. And you know it. The first time you're living in Tucson or Phoenix, Arizona, and you go out barefoot onto the street and, and, and then you blister your feet, right? <laughs> but we all know how hot the urban areas get and they don't cool off at night. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is what's called the urban heat island effect described by oh, I can't remember the name anymore. Somebody. It was a politician and a naturalist like we had back in the 1850s oh. um, anyway so we've known about the urban heat island effect for a long time basically what it does is it traps the heat even more than average for the planet traps the heat and then at night it just re-radiates that heat so places like phoenix arizona don't drop below 100 degrees fahrenheit below 40 degrees celsius all day, every day in the summer. And so, of course, one of the outcomes of that is people crank up their air conditioning. There's a self-reinforcing feedback loop for you, uh, right? And so you turn up the air conditioner even more because that's the only way you can survive when it's 40 plus degrees at night. And what does that do? Of course, it warms the planet even more. I mean, you saw this firsthand living in Arizona. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I turned on my air conditioner, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I bet. Because you would and, die if you didn't have it. Absolutely. And so the whole idea behind moving to the to the southwestern New Mexico at several hundred meters higher in elevation was to take advantage of that cooler temperature. No air conditioner there. Mm -hmm. So and it was very comfortable. Did, what did you get moisture enough to grow some plants? Oh yeah. Yeah. And I had uh, two roofs, an old mobile home and a home that I had built with a metal roof, was capturing the water off of those and doing a lot of passive water harvesting on the ground using reasonably well-known techniques. And then I had two solar pumps and a hand pump. The water table was relatively shallow there. It was about 20 feet, about six meters below the surface. So water was pretty readily accessible. Wow. Wow. And you, when I think of New Mexico, I don't think of that, but there is this mountainous region at the top who's quite, quite well, nice. Well, not only that, this is, this is uh, southwestern New Mexico. Really? Near what's called the Gila. The Gila Wilderness provided the headwaters for this place. This place is only two miles downriver from the Gila Wilderness. The Gila Wilderness is the largest and first designated wilderness area, first designated wilderness area in the world largest wilderness area in the lower 48 some in alaska that are larger so it's a big deal and has the gila river coming out of it the only undammed river that remains in new mexico and throughout much of the southwest so you know i did a bunch of research before i moved there and found out that this is this is if, if humans are going to survive and i didn't know about the aerosol masking effect the best kept secret in climate science i didn't know about a lot of things and so I lost a whole bunch of money and learned a whole lot along the way. But, <laughs> you know, learning is painful, right? <laughs> right. It's supposed to be painful. You're supposed to walk away feeling like, I'm such an idiot. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That's, that's so, me every day. <laughs> so, but then you move to Vermont, which is the Green Mountain state, and there's moisture and it's cold. And is it more, right. is it more feasible for surviving climate uh, apocalypse? Well, no, but first, first, having been betrayed, betrayed by everybody in my family, including my wife, of we were together for more than 35 years. And so first, I moved to Belize. Oh. And people accused me, well, you're moving there because you're going to survive. And I said, no, the, world is, the planet is warming. You don't want to go to the, to the equator when the planet is warming. That's the worst place to be. No. Oh. I went there because it's an amazing place and and people live simply. People continue to live simply there. And that's what I was trying to do in New Mexico. 
And that didn't pan out. So I decided to double down on my stupidity and ignorance by moving to another country. <laughs> that went well. Moved back to the United States because my partner's youngest sister was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, mm-hmm. which is sometimes called blood cancer. And so we moved back to try to get affairs in order. And we were living in um, Pleasantville, New York. This is a perfect name for a town with me living in it, right? Pleasantville. It's about an hour north of the city, of New York City. And then we moved to Central Florida, which I wouldn't recommend to anybody. (laughs) The Orlando metropolitan area. Oh, that's the worst. To get my partner's father diagnosed with mm, Alzheimer's. Which she recognized he had, but he hadn't been to a doctor. So she got him down there and it's Florida. So almost everybody there has some sort of dementia. Yeah, right. They wouldn't be living there. Yeah. And so we got him into a decent home, blah, blah, blah. And then she was betrayed by her entire family. So we're running out of family members, right? So we moved to, to Vermont for self care, basically. Now, interestingly, um, about six months after we moved here, there was a peer review paper indicating that New England and Vermont is part of New England, right smack in the middle of it. In fact, N- New England in the United States is warming up and losing habitat faster than almost any place else on Earth. Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> so, so we didn't move here to save ourselves either. It's so, it's actually just following you around. That's the thing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's me. It's my fault. I'm sorry, everybody, but just stay away. Yeah. Well, the next step after that is Antarctica, I guess. It's your last, last ditch right. effort. Uh, um, so. I can barely stand Vermont. I grew up in northern Idaho, so I'm accustomed to the yeah. cold and the snow. But after you lived in Tucson for 20 years, and then in southern New Mexico, and then in Belize, and then Florida, you, you know, your blood gets a little thin. Sure, so. sure. I bet so you, was, you have an exotic microbiome now. It's been everywhere. It's yes. at, you know. Right. So it's a little chilly here. Yeah. But it's fine. Did you grow up uh, near Coeur d'Alene or? A little bit south of there. I was actually born in Wallace, which is in Silver Valley, not far from Coeur d'Alene. And a little bit south. I grew up in a town called Wee, which you never heard of until just now, <laughs> because nobody ever has. <laughs> It had it had about 700 people living there when I was a kid. I lived there for 11 years. And my partner and I visited uh, three or four years ago. And it's now down to 400 people. What, what, what happened? <laughs> and headed south. Well, the meth labs moved in. Oh, sure. And... That, well, it was a it was a timber town when timber was king. You know, when I was there in the seventies, late sixties, basically through the seventies until nineteen seventy seven, it was timber, timber country, and and timber was king back in those days. So there was large old growth trees <laughs> that just were begging to be cut down by privileged white people. My parents were educators. My dad, uh, we moved there from Wallace, Idaho to Weeip, Idaho, because my dad got a principal position at the local elementary and middle school instead of being a fifth grade teacher. So that's why we moved there. And then later we moved to a smaller town when he got a job as a school superintendent. So I'm, I'm quite accustomed to small town life. And then I've lived in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area and Tucson, which has more than a million people. And so I've, I've lived in all sorts of places, big and small. So at some point, though, you got the you got like a feeling for the natural world. I, I just can tell by talking to you in some of the places you've been, you have an appreciation for the natural world. What's one of the first moments that you realized, hey, there's something special out here? You know, it's, it's interesting. I never realized it when I was a kid because I was immersed in it all the time. I, I lived in a village and you know what they say, it, it, it takes a child to raise a village <laughs> and burn it down on me. <laughs> <laughs> or it takes a village to raise a child, one or the other. Yeah, anyway, really. so, so it's a small town and everybody's out playing all the time. There was a stream that went right through town. You could drink out of it. 
imagine that. And so kids are just playing all the time. I, I had to be home at dark. In the summer in northern Idaho, dark came really late. So I was a, I was a free-range child, right, playing with other free-range children. And most of that time was either spent surrounded by a forest or adjacent to a stream. And one of the things we did pretty much every day after school, my dad was the principal there. So that gives you a certain privilege. The day is over at 3 or 3.30, right? So you can go hunting and fishing every day. And so every summer day, we've been fishing. That's all I knew. I was just out there all the time. And so I didn't really appreciate it. I just assumed everybody was living like this. Right? Because when you're a kid, especially when you grow up in a small town, you think everybody must live the same way. Yeah. It was after I got to college that it occurred to me, hey, that was an unusual experience. And, And a good one as it turned out. And so that's when, when it's, it was actually when I was in college that I started to realize that I had had this enormous, uh, enormously powerful and positive upbringing in this village and in, in the world. And so it was already part of me to love the natural world. I just didn't know it at the time. You think there's more philosophy in the, in the nature or rather in the cities? Hmm. It's interesting. You know, philosophy and science used to be the same thing, joined at the hip. Uh, up until really the mm, probably the, the formation of the National Science Foundation in the United States was the final nail in the coffin that separated the two. But the separation probably began in the 1800s, maybe even a little bit before that, where philosophy got stuck in this silo of being the life of the mind and scientists were doing lab work and field research and, and, and modeling all those sorts of things. And there was this sort of separation between the two. They, for hundreds of years, they were the same practice, just different techniques were used within the idea of philosophy slash science. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't well, remember I think, what your question is. But, the, but, the, but we're talking about, science and philosophy be, uh, being together. But when I think the Industrial Revolution made it so that all uh, the, the byproducts of all science became commodities. And then that started to shape everything about science at that point. Before right. that, you just had people with telescopes looking up at the moon going, eh, it's round. Right. Um, right. Yes. No, you're absolutely right. Science, the, the products of science, the products of science known as technology have been co-opted by the corporate world. And at this point, very few people understand that there's a difference between science and technology, right? So technology is one of the outcomes of science, but scientists continue to do work that has nothing to do with the potential money at the end, Mm. right? A lot of scientists are out there just trying to discover our place in the universe and what that even means, right? And so that's why I spent my uh, academic career was in the life of the mind and not so much concerned with producing things as with producing knowledge and infusing young people with the idea that knowledge matters and there's a way to go about discovering it that is useful. Yeah. And in that way, and just knowing that somebody's not a shill for some corporation somewhere, that then that means the knowledge is possibly untainted, you know, right, which is right. Cr- which then, crucial. Right. And, then, you know, that's hard to find these days and understandably because <laughs> science and scientists have been co-opted by the corporate world. It's hard to find an independent scientist these days. That's the way they all used to be. You know, they were they were all funded by rich people, typically families. That's how Charles Darwin sailed the world (laughs) and went to the Galapagos Islands and concluded that there's this thing called natural selection that leads to evolution. It's an amazing time, right? Where where so much was discovered. He was an independent scientist. He he wasn't paid for any of that. His expenses were paid by a wealthy donor. 
a family member, but it's just him out there riding in a boat and thinking. Yeah. Not under pressure to be on a deadline or that he's going to lose his grant if he doesn't come up with the solution that they're looking for. Just, exactly. hey, you're a smart guy. Here's some money. Go do some stuff. Come back. Tell us what you've figured out. Right. And that's the way it all used to be. Mm-hmm. Even through the through the 1800s, all the way through the 1800s, it was even after the Industrial Revolution began in what we typically say is 1750 plus minus two days. But but then this was up until the late 1800s, maybe even into the early 1900s, there was this spirit of independence that infused even the sciences, hmm. which is pretty amazing to think about. Yeah. Well, I hope that we can, and I'm a big fan of the idea of regressing back into any kind of old and get away from what we've created and maybe look at the native Americans and stuff and, and, and say, let's try to get back to at least this, but. You know, this, what we are lacking in as nearly as I can tell every component of Western society is respect for the planet. How could we not it's amazing to me, and yet here we are. Pauline, can you do me a favor? Turn on that light. I get to, you know, when people call you a tree hugger, it's just, it's rough. It's rough to hear those words and not, people don't want to put that obvious correlation between your living and breathing and eating and not see where it comes from and say, no, 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 sports cars and video games. That's my thing. Like, okay, well, enjoy your demise. Um, so we talked, right. we talked a little bit about feedback loops. What are some other feedback loops that we could talk about to get people, um, ready? Well, I, I identified 68 of them at guymcherson.com in this long essay called climate change summary. It used to be called climate change summary and update, but I stopped ad- updating it when I moved to Belize because telecommunications infrastructure was horrible there. So I just couldn't update it anymore. So it was going fine until 20, I think 2015 or 2016, and I identified 68 self-reinforcing feedback loops. Probably the best known is methane, and methane coming from melting permafrost or from relatively shallow continental shelves, most notably in the East Siberian Arctic Sea. And as it warms just the slightest bit, either our in marine systems or on land that increases the amount of methane that is being released. Methane is a hugely powerful greenhouse gas, far more powerful molecule for molecule than carbon dioxide. And so it warms that specific area and then goes into the atmosphere where we currently have about two and a half times the amount of methane in the atmosphere as we did at the beginning of the industrial revolution say in 1750 so that's an enormous increase but it begins locally locally there is substantial warming what that does is cause the degradation of the permafrost to occur even faster and also causes more methane to be released from those shallow continental shelves in marine systems so that's that's hugely important and relatively poorly known. There's a whole bunch of others, and I'm not going to be able to come up with them offhand. One of them, let's see, one of them, um, invasion of tall shrubs, especially in the northern part of the northern hemisphere and Europe and Asia. Huh. So sort of surrounding the arctic we have these tall shrubs and these tall sh- the invasion of the tall shrubs causes their roots to go down into the soil which warms the soil and there's permafrost in that soil and so that causes the permafrost to be released so a very slight increase in local temperature allows for these tall woody plants to move in 
previously they didn't have habitat and they couldn't survive there. Mm. But just a slight increase in temperature of the soil and bam, suddenly they're doing fine. Wow. And and so those roots go in, start churning up the soil, which is replete with methane, releases more of that methane. The roots warm the soil, further destabilizing the permafrost, contributing to further emission of greenhouse gases, including methane, as well as carbon dioxide, and therefore accelerating warming. The warming causes further warming. The snake swallows its own tail. Right? And there's nothing, once one of those has started, anyone has started, there's no stopping it. There's no known way that humans can stop it. So the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, finally caught up with reality on September 24th, 2019, with the IPCC Special Report on the Ocean and Cryosphere and a Change in Climate. So that's the name of the thing. Mm -hmm. They attributed the irreversibility of climate change to an overheated ocean, and particularly with this line, quote, ocean acidification and deoxygenation, ice sheet and glacier mass loss, and Oh, oh, lost you for a oh. second. All right. So I'll start over with the quote from yeah, yeah. the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere and changing climate. So again, this came out September 24th, 2019. Quote, ocean acidification and deoxygenation, ice sheet and glacier mass loss, and permafrost degradation are expected to be irreversible on timescales relevant to human societies and ecosystems. Now, bear in mind that it only takes one so for enforcing feedback loop or tipping point or, or feedback loop, only one is needed to ensure the irreversibility of climate change. And the IPCC admitted to this one more than three years ago. I never hear a peep about it from the corporate media, not one thing ever. And yet the IPCC, one of the most conservative political bodies that's trying, trying to disguise itself as a scientific body, has concluded that climate change is irreversible. They also concluded that climate change is more abrupt than any previous event in planetary history. You never hear about that either. It was more than four years ago with their report global warming of 1.5 degrees. It's it's crucial for people like that who say stuff like that to be called crazy because they want to continue to do this until the last possible moment. Right. Right, absolutely. You know, John Kenneth Galbraith has this great, great quote. Let's see if I can find it around here somewhere. You know, from his 1977 book, The Age of Uncertainty, chapter one, page 22. People of privilege will always risk their complete destruction rather than surrender any material part of their advantage. And <laughs> and most of the people writing for the IPCC, most of the people in in the United Nations who are who are given the responsibility of keeping that ship together, they're people of privilege. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I think the people that don't come from privilege are the ones that are the more ready to take on that, and will be. Eventually, poor people are going to be the ones that feel the effects first, and the rich people are just going to try to insulate themselves from it. For as long as they can, they already are. Are they build the building bunkers and stuff like this? No, no, I, I'm talking about the poor people. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. When I saw it when I was living in Belize and and when I was on speaking tour in Western Europe in late 2015, it's interesting. 2015 now, and there are a bunch of immigrants trying to get their way into. Western Europe, all over Western Europe, and everywhere I went, I, I tend to think of Western Europeans as being more enlightened than Americans, because how could you not be? And yet, almost everywhere I spoke, dozens of places, people were complaining about these people coming from the Middle East and Northern Africa, invading and taking their stuff. Sure. It sounded like, sounded like people in the United States talking about people from Mexico or Central America, right? These people are not coming there for a party. They're not coming there to visit Disneyland. Come on. They're they're going there because they can no longer survive. They can no longer grow food that they've been growing for generations where they used to live. Perfect. It's already happening. The peer reviewed literature indicates that because of what they call non-optimal temperatures, we're already 
causing the death of more than 5 million people a year. Hmm. So it's already happening. Hmm. Uh, a lot of it is a, is a result of what's called the lethal wet bulb temperature, which is a combination of humidity and high temperature that together make for a lethal environment and cause your organs to break down. And, and there are signs. We saw it when we were living in Belize. So this is 2016, 2017, I think into 2018. And we would be working with carpenters on the property, people who had been swinging a hammer and holding a saw for their entire lives. And here they are in their 40s, their 30s or their 40s. And suddenly they're acting drunk. They're they're, they're exhibiting this behavior like, where did that come from? They have slurred speech. They're tripping where they never tripped before. And those are signs that we have exceeded lethal wet mold temperatures and it's impairing the judgment of these people. So, of course, we'd set them down, put them in the shade, throw them in the pool, give them a drink of water, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, this is happening all over the place. And this was five years ago. And... And a lot of people obviously are not going to recognize what's going on. So people are going to be hurt even worse than is already happening. And this is affecting third world countries or whatever, every other country except the privileged ones uh, first. Right. Hmm. And, and it's affecting um, migrant workers in first world countries, too. You know, like the southern United States is already being severely impacted, especially the deep south from Texas to Florida. The ones that we make uh, pick our vegetables for us. and yeah, Exactly. Like exactly. Well, well, it goes without saying that the idea of privilege from like a, you know, sociological point of view, privilege is like a disease and adversity is the cure. And if people just went through trauma and heartache and pain, that they would be more empathetic individuals and be able to start, maybe start solving this climate change thing, maybe start treating animals better, start treating right. refugees better. Yeah. Or and even that, their own family members. There you go. There you go. And we're going through I mean, I, the same thing with my family. Yeah. I see it everywhere. You know, people just can't seem to wrap their minds around the idea of being a decent human being. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> it's such a strange concept. I know. Did you learn anything from your parents at all? <sighs> and this is the oh, thing is when you're highly empathetic and you go around with your highly empathetic views, people treat you like you're handicapped. Right. Yes. They, they see it as a weakness. Right. Right? You're kind. Oh, that's a sign of weakness. <laughs> Where did that come from? And then they try to take advantage of you or something like this. It's like, of no, course, I'm, not, I'm not an idiot. You're obviously weak or you wouldn't be compassionate. <laughs> oh, God. So, well, that, that brings me to the most important thing. You've made a lot of great predictions on when this whole horrible mess will be over with. How long more do we have? How much time do we have? Uh, we have three minutes. <laughs> three minutes. And with every breath, we get a reset. Okay. God. Beyond our individual selves and yeah, the yeah. notion of taking full advantage of the time we have, of making three minutes actually matter as, as we could be doing, right? We could be acting as if every, every moment matters. It was Homer in the Iliad nearly 2,800 years ago wrote, any moment might be our last. That's a long time ago. And so he was thinking about living in the moment, about what it means to take advantage of every single moment of your life. Beyond our individual selves, my predictions about retention of habitat for human animals depend completely upon the work of other scholars. I didn't discover the ideas of abrupt irreversible climate change or the aerosol masking effect until I left active service on campus. So I was living out in the boonies with apparently too much time on my hands, not spent <laughs> with the goats and the crops. And, and I came across these ideas. Wow. Blows your mind. 
So I depend completely upon the work of other scholars, most notably the, the authors of peer-reviewed papers, both in those papers and occasionally the opinions of the people who write the papers. So if they are correct, then we don't have until 2026. Bear in mind that between loss of habitat and extinction is a very short period of time. In, in one case, a bird the San Benedicto rock wren, which lived on an island, San Benedicto Island, off the Pacific coast of Mexico. In, on August 1st, 1952, the San Benedicto Island suddenly became volcanic and exploded. The San Benedicto rock wren flew around, obviously. It could fly. So it went to the mainland, without question, went to these islands nearby, couldn't find any habitat. Extinct in a week. Mm. And it could fly. Mm. I don't know about you, but I don't fly. <laughs> I, I, I tried I, when I was a kid. Didn't work out at all. I'm not a good flyer. <laughs> so yeah. so if if those scholars are correct and on uh, on you know if I'm if I'm relying correctly upon what they're saying, then we don't have till 2026, and I realize that's just a very short time from now. Even if even if a bunch of them turn out to be wrong, and therefore I'm wrong, I still don't think we have until 2030. Yeah. And you could argue that there's very little difference between 2026 20, and 2030, but I just talked about the importance of living in the moment and making those moments last. So four years? Are you kidding me? That's forever. Yeah. So obviously, I'd be I'd like to be wrong about all of them in in turning to the peer reviewed literature and the people who write those papers. And so I would love for them to be wrong. And I already indicated a case in which they were wrong, the annual review of Earth and planetary sciences, when that projection was made in the 2012 issue, indicating that we had until 2016 plus or minus three years. So hmm. that's 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. We made it 11, 12 years already yeah. beyond their original projection. So occasionally the peer reviewed literature gets things wrong and I hope it gets it all wrong because that's the work I rely upon. Yeah. There's nothing I would like more than to have people make fun of me and string me up, tar and feather me because I was wrong about near term human extinction. That would be lovely, really. The, the opposite, there'd be nobody to tar and feather you around if you were right. <laughs> See, that's the part that sucks. If I'm right, I can't go around saying I told you so because I'll be dead. It'll be your last words, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I told you so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's the that's the always the thing about being pessimistic. If you're pessimistic and you're right, then it's, you know, you have the satisfaction of being right. But if you're wrong and everything's just fine, that's it's win-win basically right right so yes i would love for all these papers to be wrong i really would i can't imagine that's the case the peer-reviewed literature tends to be produced by very conservative people and the whole process of peer review is very conservative it takes years to get a paper published in a peer-reviewed outlet it's not something you write up one day send it in and it's published the next mm -hmm. you know like newspaper writers or something like that so i mean this is pretty serious stuff I mean, yeah. psychologically, it's a little rough to be in this state of lingering and waiting and an anxiety. You're like a cow on the slaughter line. Um, I'd rather kind of be moved through it faster, you know, so I'm voting for 2026. <laughs> well, it's really interesting because you've heard of compassion fatigue. Most people have heard of compassion fatigue, right? And you, you're, you're providing some service to humans, often in healthcare. And you just you do that for years and you just get completely burned out, compassion fatigue. You just can't do it anymore because you've been doing it for many years. It's driving you nuts. I've recently termed a phrase collapse fatigue. 
I see people all the time who were completely on board with human extinction by the day after tomorrow or the very <laughs> latest next Tuesday. And then suddenly it's just not going fast enough. It hasn't happened, so it can't possibly happen. That's their mentality. And therefore, I was wrong. Yeah. Right. I was wrong in 2017 or 2018, whenever that was. So I'm wrong forever. Yeah. And they, they're just worn out. They've got collapse fatigue. Hmm. They, they just they heard about it for a long period of time and enough enough already yeah right so i'm going back to party land i th i think that's fueling a lot of climate denialism and then the other ones who were actually waiting for the human extinction they probably get in their car and like drive around in circles being like trying to trying to speed it up the process you know with the, you pollute more and spray and yeah right. uh, so you know there there were two films that came out in 2021 that I thought did a really nice job with climate change. One being Don't Look Up. That's probably the one more people saw. It's the one that I thought was actually better. It was more subtle in its approach to climate change was Finch. Oh, I didn't Finch see is, that. Finch is named after the character played by Tom Hanks. Oh, and there's yeah. Very, Right. And, and it's very subtle. So they describe what happens when nuclear power plants melt down without ever mentioning that nu nuclear power plants are melting down. And how they describe it is when nuclear power plants melt down or when we lose a lot of ionizing radiation from the surface, that ionizing radiation is going to go up into the stratosphere and strip away the ozone. We need that ozone because it's it's one of the things keeping the planet relatively cool. You strip away that ozone, and so they showed scenes. Somebody put their hand out their window and it just fry in a few seconds, right? It's completely sunburned in a few seconds. Well, actually, it would take a few minutes. Uh -huh. But that's one of the consequences of too much ionizing radiation entering the stratosphere. So if we have nuclear power plants meltdown, so this is my, this is my primary concern in the wake of humans or the idiocy of humans or the lack of knowledge of humans with respect to ionizing radiation, we're going to allow a bunch of nuclear power plants to melt down 450, some of them, as I recall. And that's going to unleash this ionizing radiation into the stratosphere. It's going to strip away stratospheric ozone. And, and you, you think we're heating the planet now? You know, that's going to happen within a few minutes. We're, lose, we're going to lose habitat for probably all life on Earth because of that rapid rate of environmental change. And I'm no fan. You know, yeah. much as I dislike certain individual humans and sure. sometimes the human race, I still don't want every, every bug and bunny to be gone. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And we did that. We had, the, we had the great Brian Toon, the nuclear expert, he came on and said, uh, when those nuclear power plants that need to be manned uh, in order to keep cool, when they go, they can be 500 times stronger than a, a nuclear hydrogen bomb. So it's no joke. It's no joke. But, you know, I, my, my thing, I'm an entropy buff, right? I, I get it over and get as fast as, as fast as possible. We were talking before we started about the great George Carlin, and I think nobody nails it better than George Carlin. Right. Pack your bags, folks. We're going away. <laughs> <laughs> right. And he did. He did. He, you know, he had, he was basically a social commentary guy. He, he did social commentary and he disguised it with humor. Yeah. Mo modern day philosopher. Right. Absolutely. And, and the person who comes closest to that today, I think, is Louis C.K., who, who, you know, he got me too. I get that. Sure. And maybe he was a horrible person. I don't know. I we don't, aren't neighbors. I don't think so. We don't, we don't talk. But anyway, <laughs> he does social commentary disguised as humor. And in fact, he directed and played a minor part in a book, in a movie called The Fourth of July. That's out relatively recently. And, and it's not funny. I mean, it has a couple of funny scenes, but it's not intended to be funny. It's social commentary. It's great stuff. Mm. And so, yeah, it's interesting because he had an opportunity to meet with George Carlin. Early in his career, he meets George Carlin and he says, George, nice to meet you. I've got this great routine, right? And it's amazing. And I've worked on it for years. And it's fantastic. And I can't seem to get out of these shitty bars, right? I'm, I haven't taken it to the next level. And Carlin says, yeah, throw that routine out. He said, no, no, no. I don't think you understand. It's perfect. I have all my friends say that it couldn't be any better. He says, yeah, throw it out. Throw it out every year. You think there's not enough material out there? 
come on, look at humans. <laughs> he said, throw it out every year, use new material that will get you on the talk show circuit. That'll be your, your performance, right, for the year. And then you get new stuff. Yeah. yeah. And his career went meteoric after that. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not making the social commentary, then you're not really finding what humor is our tool that helps us get through life. Absolutely. No question about it. Yeah. You know, if it weren't for my reasonably decent sense of humor, my students would have never learned anything in my classes. <laughs> and I, I can't imagine I, I would be worth putting up with today. Sure, sure. You got to make it funny. If you're going to be all doom and gloom, make it funny and people will listen. Right. I just right. listen to George Carlin say, Jeffrey Dahmer, so what? I don't see what the big deal is. It's just, that's just the epitome <laughs> of <laughs> So you kill a few people, eat them, and keep their head in your fridge. What's the big deal? <laughs> um, so I, I want to end on a good note here, uh, like a positive note. You've traveled extensively. You've witnessed some beautiful places, been all over the world. What's some of your favorite places you've been? Ah, uh, so many beautiful places on earth, and I've seen far too few of them. New Zealand stands out, both for the people and the ecosystems. Beautiful place, beautiful people. I've been there six times, mostly on speaking tours. And the, the downside to being on speaking tours is I don't know what happened. It's just a blur for the whole thing, right, from one venue to the next. Anyway, Norway stands out. It's probably the cleanest country I've ever seen. Wow. Norway is, is beautiful. Iceland comes in a close second in, in terms of cleanliness and people actually, you know, taking care of the environment. Nobody throws a plastic bag out of their window along the highway. Nobody does that in those countries. I don't know what's the deal. Maybe you get shot immediately by the police. I don't know. <laughs> Something is keeping them, keep those places clean. And I, I love my short time in Ireland and in fact, all of Western Europe. Mm. And I remain odd by the Sonoran Desert after living there for 20 years, being on campus at the University of Arizona. It's an amazing, incredible place. And so whether it's really hot or really cold, I seem to like it. And beautiful Bellows Falls, Vermont, where I live right now. It isn't bad. <laughs> I've, I've been to Vermont, and I got to say, I, I like it. I like it. I think it's great. And the people are actually halfway decent. Right. Yeah. And, you know, mostly you get what you give. So yeah, yeah. if you don't be a jerk, you probably aren't going to have a jerk fire back at you. I mean, <laughs> we all know exceptions, right? Right. Well, I mean, you live you live near Orlando, so that's got to be <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. As long as 17 months of my life. Oh, God. I went there. I went there for about a week and I thought, okay, get, me, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Yeah, some people learn faster than the rest of us. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I guess we'll wrap it up. We'll talk after this, and then you know, you come back maybe next year. We, we can do this easily anytime because we're just cut from the same cloth. Right, and every week there's a bunch of new information indicating how horrible the climate change situation yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. So why would you not want to hear about that? <laughs> <laughs> All we hope is that. There will be a next year. We'll see. Yeah, exactly. All right. Well, Guy McPherson, PhD, study natural resources, ecology, and evolutionary biology. Wonderful human being. Anything you want to add? Nope, that's it. Well, you, you can find my work at guymcpherson.com. There we go. It's freely available. doesn't cost you a thing. So knock yourself out. There'll be some links in the description. We're going to hook him up and everybody go check him out. All right. We'll say for the chat. I appreciate it. Say goodbye to everybody in TV land. Bye bye. <laughs>